Well, to me falls the privilege of introducing our speaker this morning, Neil Hudson. Um, I'm expected to use my pastoral gifts, I think, to uh, reduce the level of nervousness of all people. Neil is already feeling nervous because somebody was incautious enough to tell him how good uh, Helen Ann and Gordon were yesterday. Um, Neil, even if you're rubbish, people will still be very well. That's uh, really helpful. <laughs> Uh, I will try to be. Oh, fine. <laughs> Thank you. It'll only improve from here. Um, but equally, there may be people out there who also are feeling a little bit nervous, uh, knowing that we, uh, you'll have read the brochure and know that we have a speaker from the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity. And some people may be thinking, oh my goodness, is this going to be well over my head? I've actually heard Neil speak twice. The first time was at Spring Harvest, where he amply demonstrated his ability to communicate with ordinary people, so that's really helpful. The other degree of nervousness may be London Institute of Contemporary Christianity. What's this really got to say to us in our rural settings? And once again, I can possibly just comment on the fact that the last time I heard Neil speak was at a conference organised by the Arthur Rank Centre called Germinate. It was over in Coventry uh, last year. You can look, at, look it up on the website where you'll see that there are photographs of uh, Ashley and Penny Evans and Caroline Pascoe, so it must have been a good conference. Um, <laughs> but uh, once again, uh, Neil was able to demonstrate that the, the things he wants, that are his passions, very much do apply to us in our rural settings also. So, Neil, we're very much looking forward to hearing what Thank you're going to say to us and learning how we can apply to that. Just before you do that, however... <laughs> you're clearly not looking forward to it that much. <laughs> <laughs> exactly so. There was um, one of my tutors at Theological College reported on having been to a, a, a black church in the USA and um, said that if the preacher was really doing well, then people would, would say, preach it, brother. And if, if he was having a bit of problem, then they'd say, help him, Lord. So, <laughs> in, in the spirit of help him, Lord, <laughs> let's begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we're such a diverse group of people, but we're united in our love for Jesus and in our desire to serve him in this world. And Lord, we pray that you would bless Neil now as he speaks to us, and that out of what he says, you would bring to our hearts particular things that we need to know in order to do your work better. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Father. Well, good morning. morning. You don't know how intimidating you look. <laughs> it feels like a, a, some sort of X factor with the judges on the front here and the rest of you just watching on. It's a delight to be with you. Um, as Paddy said, I uh, work for uh, this group called the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity. And our concern, we were formed around 30 years ago in and by the ministry of John Stott. Uh, John Stott was one of, as you will well know, uh, was one of the leading uh, figures in 20th century, um, certainly evangelicalism, but internationally around the world. His legacy lives on. When John Stott was 65, uh, after a very fruitful ministry at All Souls and a writing uh, legacy that many of us still rely on from time to time and the international work he'd been involved with. He became increasingly concerned that in his view it was possible to be really good at church things and actually to have a lot of responsibility for ministry within the church. He was also concerned that it was possible to be able to find your way around the Bible relatively well, to be quite biblically literate, and yet really struggle to know how does that world relate to the world, the, nine, the proverbial nine to five world, the everyday world that people find themselves in day in, day out. And 30 odd years ago, he established the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity, not out of a desire to create some intellectual think tank nor to make us cultural critics, 
but out of a desire to equip the people of God to know how does the gospel of Christ make a difference in the complex world that we live in together. And over 30 years we've continued that work in lots of different ways, trying to enable people to have a missional imagination for the world in which they find themselves. That's the group I work with. But just the other thing, just to give you a little bit of a map in your own mind about where I'm coming from. I work for that group four days a week. And the rest of my time, I'm a local church leader who lives in Salford, Manchester. I've actually only, this is the, the, the other bit of this, if I've actually only ministered in two churches. I, I, I've been ordained for nearly 30 years now. I know what you're thinking. Um, <laughs> but um, I've actually only ministered in two. One was in Guernsey. Now, I don't know if you've been to Guernsey, but Guernsey is beautiful. And certainly at the time we were there, um, when you went to the town, uh, 30 miles an hour in your car, which was the speed limit on the whole of the island, except where it was 20, um, you parked your car on the pier, and because your car keys are a little bulky in your pocket, you don't want to carry them around as you do your shopping, you pop them in the footwell of your car, close your door, do your shopping, come back, and of course when you get back, your car is still there. For if they took it, where would they actually go? <laughs> an island nine miles by three, you'd just walk and get it back again, wouldn't you? <laughs> and from there, after three idyllic years on Guernsey, we moved to Salford. <laughs> now, I don't know if you've been to Salford. <laughs> Salford is very similar to Guernsey in many ways, in as much as they both speak English. Um, and uh, on the first week, this is exactly the case, on the first week of being there, um, on the Friday evening we had a leaders meeting in the church building and uh, one of the deacon's cars got stolen and uh, because I was very very young and I wanted to appear like this spiritual giant I suggested we would pray for the young lads who'd stolen the car and uh, we prayed that they might switch on the tape recorder in the car and listen to Graham Kendrick singing make way make way <laughs> and that somehow that would lead them to saving faith we prayed that prayer a lot over those years. <laughs> Until we began to pray a more biblical prayer, a more psalm-like prayer that essentially said, Oh God, get them. <laughs> and that has been... <laughs> We're going to get on fine this morning. <laughs> um, that has been the, the, the context in which uh, I've ministered for the last 27 years. Um, some of that time I've been full-time paid uh, leader, paid uh, minister of the church. Um, and then 11 years I worked in a, theologi a theological college but still was part of the church. And then after a little while I was invited back into a part-time leadership role. And uh, I've worked with LICC for 10 years but still have continued uh, to be part of a leadership team of a very ordinary church um, in Salford. The reason for all of that is to say that anything I say this morning is filtered through um, the need for integrity that says, actually, I'm not just talking about this, about something I would do if I had my time again, or we used to do, but actually we're trying to do it locally. Every context is unique. Every church is different because God has a story for your church and God's got his own history with your place and his own future with your place. But together we might discern what does it mean to be the missional people of God for the sake of a world that he loves so much. And that's kind of where I want to go this morning. I've been invited as part of your process over these three days to think about mind the gap and my area that I was asked to speak about was really the gap between God and the church what's God wanting for us to be and what does God want us to do a couple of weeks ago um, a small group of men in the church were meeting in my church and we were reading together from Genesis 32 
And um, it's the passage that talks about Jacob, the great deceiver, the twister, the guy who's got through life on his wits, uh, the guy who has uh, had to uh, manipulate situations as much as he could to get the things that he felt were going to be important from birth, really. And it's Genesis 32 is that moment where uh, he's about to meet his brother, Esau. This is years into their life. And you'll remember that Jacob uh, managed to uh, deceive Esau out of his birthright. And Jacob has prospered, but so has Esau. And the meeting is about to take place. And Jacob does a couple of things. One of them is he sends uh, a gift in verse 13. He selects a gift for his brother Esau. He's clearly trying to soften Esau up in case Esau takes revenge. But this is the gift. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, 10 male donkeys. He put them in the care of his servants, each herd by itself, and said to his servants, go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. That's some gift. This is a man who's worried about meeting his own past. And he instructs all his people to go ahead of him over the brook. And then when Jacob is alone that night, a man wrestled with him till daybreak. And when the man saw that he couldn't overcome him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. The man said, let me go for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the man asked him, what's your name? Jacob, he answered. And the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because you struggled with God and with human beings, and you've overcome. Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It's because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. A deeply mysterious story. We're not quite sure what's really going on there. Who is this man who seeks to overpower Jacob? I have a suspicion that pieces like that in the Bible were placed there in order to give theologians work. <laughs> but at this men's group, we were talking together about that passage. And one guy said, he said, I've never really thought about it like this, but all my life I thought I'd been wrestling with God. But what if God has been wrestling with me? And in thinking through this morning, I felt it was an appropriate place to begin. I don't know about you, but as someone who has a responsibility for a local church, as someone who's really committed to local church, in fact, given pretty much most of my life to the activity of local church, there's been times when I've been deeply confused by some of the things that I felt have been happening there. And there's been lots of times when I've been feeling like I've been wrestling with God. Oh God, why? But what if... For much of the time, God's been wrestling with me and our church. What if God is wrestling with our church as a whole in the UK? You know that we might be the people named for him and indeed named by him. I want to think this morning in the time I have about the missional impulse of God's spirit about how God wants to use his people to be the agents of his kingdom. And in the presentation I want to give, uh, I want to outline what I think um, I've come to believe are four moves that need to happen in order for our churches, our gathered church, to be places that inspire people and enable people to live missionally wherever they find themselves. And these are the four moves I'm going to outline. The move from us being engaged in mission to being missional. The move from us emphasizing membership to emphasizing discipleship. The move from expecting to have authority to one of, at the very most, having influence. 
and the move from being inward looking to be outward looking. I'm going to take them one by one and explore some of the lessons we've learned along the way as we've worked with churches of all traditions in all kinds of situations. The move from mission to missional. If you look at that grid, and some of you may well have seen this sort of grid before, but the red dot represents the proportion of people, the percentage of people in the UK that worships in a church context, regardless of tradition, once a month or more. It's very difficult to get exact figures, but it's somewhere around that sort of figure around five to seven. It means that the rest of the grey dots, I'm not commenting on about where they stand or what they believe or indeed even how they practice, but simply to say this, that the vast majority of our country have decided that the very thing that you and I have given our lives to is at best not for them. I think actually a lot of those people, and, and probably depending on your context, you will find it uh, more so in certain parts of the country. I think a lot of those people are kind of glad we're there. In the same way as some of us get really upset when we see our local library closing, even if truth be known we've not used it for 15 years. But actually, that engagement week in, week out, month in, month out, is often uh, designated by those red dots in the corner. And yet, those red dots in the corner, we punch well above our weight. We do some remarkable things. We're not the only people to do these things, but debt advice and cap centers around the country are often fueled by the church. Food banks are fueled by the church. The youth work now that, as a country, our youth services have kind of collapsed because of lack of funding, it's the churches that are actually doing most of the children and youth work in our country. It's the churches that are doing so much of the work with the elderly and the, the lonely and the housebound. We do remarkable numbers of activities. We make a difference. But actually, Here's the thing, we know there are more opportunities than we feel we have resources. I'm not expecting you to respond to this, um, input, you know. but how many of you are longing for someone to come along and go, I think if you could give us more time, we could do a lot more. How many of you are sitting there going, do you know what, I'm longing for a new project. <laughs> How many of you in your PCCs sit around going, I do hope the vicar's got a new idea? <laughs> and I do hope it demands more of our time. And I do hope we don't stop anything in order to start something new. Mm. Now you may. You may be in that position. And if you are, please make yourself known at the end because <laughs> people, vicars, would want to join your church. <laughs> Most of us actually are frustrated because it's the frustration level comes because of the, the level of opportunity that we have to bless and serve and minister to our communities and the resources we feel we have. And so although we've done great things, actually when you look at that picture, it kind of looks a little overwhelming at times. And you think, well, how, how can we really make a difference? And perhaps the reality for some of you is, how can we really make a difference when those red dots are growing older? <laughs> so you agree with that bit? <laughs> You know, 20 years ago, we were able to do X, Y, Z, but now we're just a little more tired. 
And so the mission model that most of us have inherited is one where we say we'll work from solely the gathered church. And what that actually means often is that you've got the, the folks who are really involved and then you've got the three dots at the back who are going, we're right behind you. <laughs> we're right behind you. It's a great idea, you're going to do more. But actually, you and I both know that that's not where your church that you worshipped with on Sunday, that's not where they are today. That's not where they are this morning. This morning, they're scattered. They're scattered all over your parish. They're scattered all over the towns and villages. They're scattered all over your region. They're in uh, at school gates. They're in offices. They're in shops. They're in care homes. And what we began to ask ourselves was that actually we know we've got a mission problem. And if we only rely on that model, actually what we will do is we will do some great things, but actually most of us will feel overwhelmed most of the time. But actually what happens if you start to say, well, what does it mean to equip those people in their scattered places where they already are, rather than trying to persuade people to do things in places where they aren't. Let me illustrate it with a story of a woman I met many years ago now, but her name was Isabel, and we were in a small church in the northeast of England uh, in the PCC meeting, there's about seven or eight of us. And I was sitting, chatting with uh, this group, and I turned to Isabel and said, Isabel, where do you spend most of your time, and what do you spend most of your time doing? She was in her 60s, mid-60s, I think. And she said, well, I cook, I shop, I look after the house, I care for my husband. A couple of days a week, I pick the grandchildren up from school, and on, the, on a Sunday, my eldest grandchild comes for lunch. She doesn't come to church, but she comes for lunch. We got chatting about our grandchild. She said, tell me about your grandchildren. How old are they? And she said, well, the ones we pick up from school, they're seven or eight years old. Uh, but my eldest, the one that comes on uh, Sunday lunch, um, she's 23. And actually, uh, quite a lot, she'll ask me what I've been doing that morning. She'll ask me about the service, and she'll ask me about the sermon. And so I'll talk to her about what's gone on in church. Now, the interesting thing was the vicar's in the room. And the vicar's ears prick up. Because the vicar thinks he's been preaching to a bunch of 65 plus congregation. And he has. But what he didn't realize is that one of them is re-preaching his sermon to a 23 year old. He's been longing for 23 year olds. <laughs> so the vicar asked a really good question. What could I preach that would be more helpful for your grandchild? That's a really good question, isn't it? What's your grandchild really interested in, and how could I help you have a conversation with her about things that matter to her? Anyway, we prayed for Isabel, and we prayed for her grandchildren. Nobody knew the names of her grandchildren, because her grandchildren didn't come to church, and she'd never talked about it. So we prayed for her as a PCC. We prayed, and we uh, kind of commissioned her back to her family. And three months later, I went back and I said, Isabel, tell me, how's it going? She said, well, these were exact words, well, I'm on a roll. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? She said, brilliant. She said, my daughter's talking to me now about church and faith. And, I'm, and then she just said this phrase, she said, I think I know what I'm supposed to be doing now. Now, here's the interesting thing. She was doing nothing new. But she was doing everything she had been doing with new eyes. Now what happens when the people of God engage in mission, not because they start to do something new, but they do what they're doing already with new eyes? If we can get that right between us, then it doesn't actually matter about the size of your church. It doesn't matter whether there's 20 of you or 200 of you. It doesn't actually matter about your spiritual tradition. It matters whether you're passionate, but it doesn't matter about your tradition. 
It doesn't matter about the demographics now. Because it doesn't matter if you've got a church full of 40-year-olds or 20-year-olds or 60-year-olds. Because actually, we've all got a scattered life. And it doesn't matter whether you're rural, suburban, or whether you're on an estate. What matters is that you see yourself through new eyes. The principle is the same. The big idea is that the Spirit of God wraps up the people of God into the mission of God. That's what the Spirit wants to do. That's the work of the Spirit. And I think that one of the things that, the, that God, by His Spirit, wrestles with His church is, will you be on my work? Or do you only want me to be on yours? So our intention is that we, as people who have responsibilities in local church, become aware of what does that look like. And the implication is that we need to send people out, ready and able to live as red dots, wherever they are. The problem with that picture is if we all go grey. Isn't it? If actually our responses and reactions are exactly the same as anybody else, then anything we have said together in church, any prayer we have prayed, actually is negated. You see, I think for folks like yourself, in your tradition, week by week, you gather together to recite a creed. A creed that is declared by the whole congregation. We live in a different story. We see the whole world differently. The moment you start talking about God being a creator, the moment you st start talking about his son coming, you, the moment you start talking about the spirit and the church and the hope to come, you declare together, we see everything differently. We live in a different story. And the moment you gather together and someone leads you in prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, and you pray, may your kingdom come. You are praying for regime change. Only those people who know things are not right around here will ever pray, may your kingdom come. If you're happy with the status quo of things around here, you'll never pray, may your kingdom come, because you've got to be honest, it's all right. <laughs> I was once exploring this sort of stuff down in the New Forest. I don't know if you've been in the New Forest. But the New Forest, I've only, I've only ever been once, but it's like ponies are everywhere. <laughs> What's that about? I'm kind of used to dogs, but ponies. <laughs> and uh, in a context, not dissimilar to this, I said, what will it look like in the new forest when the kingdom comes in full? And they said, well, oh, pretty much like it is now. <laughs> and I said, I live in Salford. I've got more at stake here. <laughs> but do you get that sort of urgency? When you pray together, may your kingdom come, may your will be done here on earth in the Diocese of Hereford as it is in heaven. You are declaring something richly different about the world and everything about it. You're saying, I don't trust that we can solve this alone. I don't think we've got the resources we need unless God steps in I'm not sure what's going to happen next. Which clearly has an implication about the fact that what we're about together is not just being members of the church, but actually church communities that form disciples of this Jesus. This Jesus who came and said, I'm here to declare the kingdom of God is near and has come. And to invite you into it. All those years ago when I uh, began working in Salford, from time to time people would come to me and say something along this line. Neil, it's nothing personal. <laughs> And I'd always want to stop and go, well, in that case, you've probably got the wrong person. No, 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 no. It's nothing personal, but. And then they would outline a litany of pastoral failure. 
They would say, your sermons aren't very good, the service leading is fairly awful, your administration is rubbish, you're not very good at pastoral care, and, uh, you know, communication, we just don't know what's going on. And then, if they really wanted to put the boot in, they would say, but above all, and you just kind of want to go, what? Above all that? Yeah, 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 above all. Oh, thanks ever so much. This is so helpful. Above all. Above all. And then they would say one of two things. They would say, either our church is not loving enough, or you don't care enough. I'd like to be able to say that at that stage, normally I would say, yeah, you're right. But I, I, I'd start to defend us. And I'd say to them, do you remember when you were ill? And because we followed Jesus, we made all those quiches for you. <laughs> Do you remember those days? Do you remember when actually, you know, you needed finance and we helped you and we gave you money and we just gave it as a gift? Do you remember those days? Do you remember the hours I spent talking with you about your own situation and trying to unravel the situation? Do you remember all that? And it was never enough. So I would go home. This is absolutely true. I'd go home and I'd start to beat myself up. Because here's the truth as a minister in a church. They're probably right. You could have gone a little bit more often. You could have called them a few more times. You could have done more. So after two days, on the whole, of beating myself up and feeling fairly rubbish, I'd then start to prepare a sermon in order to beat everybody else up. <laughs> which on balance was much more fun. <laughs> and I would talk about the need for us to be a loving church because actually there's people here who don't feel they, they're being cared for, etc, etc, etc. And it was years, it was absolutely years before I came to the realisation that nobody had ever said to me, Neil, above all, you've not discipled us. We've not changed. Above all, You've not enabled us to live as missional people of God. Above all, Neil, you've not actually enabled us to follow Jesus closely enough. And here's the reason. It wasn't because we were doing it well at all. The simple reason was this. They didn't think that was the deal. The deal in their minds. And actually, if I'm really honest, the deal in my mind was fairly clear. So it was my job to come with some sort of vision for the church and it was their job to argue about that for a while and it was my job to try and recruit people to that vision and in return they would be cared for that was kind of like the unwritten deal just as an aside, if you really want to know what your culture of your church is really about, if you really want to know what people really think about your church, just take time to listen to what they complain about. Now some of you probably have people complaining about nothing. One of you clearly has someone ringing now to complain about something. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to know about the culture of the church, what do people call you out on? Let me use an example. Uh, you won't because there's not one around. But supposing you decided this evening, instead of the, the meal that's going to be served and the wine that's going to be uh, ready for you, is a very clever idea at the beginning of the day to say that's how the day's going to end because however rubbish the rest of the day is, you go, <laughs> there's wine. Um, supposing you decided this evening that instead of eating here, what you'd do is you'd go to McDonald's. Now, I don't think you can do that around here, but anyway. <laughs> You've probably heard of it. Um, <laughs> if you've not, just turn to your neighbour and go, I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> this is the deal in McDonald's. Some of you look like you've never been to McDonald's or not for a long time. Let me explain McDonald's. <laughs> you walk into a brightly lit room that's got music playing and the menu is on the board behind the people who serve you and it's backlit. So for those of us whose eyesight is going, we can barely see it. It's just a blur. The real problem comes if there's not much of a queue because you've got to decide really quick. 
and you can't just say, can I have a burger? Because it's like, that is, that is, yeah. So you have to make a decision really quick. And then the, the people who serve you uh, look over their shoulder, shout back the order, and they bring it you on a plastic tray with a piece of paper. And you normally get chips with it, because you're going for the healthy option. And, um, <laughs> and the chips are in a little bag, and the chips always spill out all over the tray. And your burger comes in a plastic kind of container, and you go back, and you go and get any condiments that you wish. You go and then get that, and then you go back to your table, which has normally got a fixed chair, just in case you go berserk. <laughs> <laughs> on, on a Formica top table, which may or may not be sticky. <laughs> okay. And it's normally next to where people are queuing to do exactly the same as you've just done. And, and when you finish your meal, which you, you, you finish quick, you then go and tidy up again. All right, so you collect all your rubbish and pop it in the bin and put your tray on the side. And you go out and you go, that was seven pounds well spent. <laughs> and you don't complain unless the fellow who serves you takes five minutes to get your burger. And then you'll complain. But supposing this evening you decide, I'm not going to McDonald's, I'm going to go to a restaurant with a loved one. And you walk in the restaurant, and as you're greeted, they go, do you mind just going to the kitchen hatch? We're kind of trying to keep costs down, because the minimum wage is going to be raised, and we can't keep everybody involved here. So if you could go to the kitchen hatch and just tell them what you want, and do you mind if you don't have a plate? <laughs> Can we just give you a plastic, we'll give you some paper. Um, would you be okay about that? And then when you finish, can you, can you kind of eat quick? And when you finish, can you tidy up? That'd be great. You'd complain. And it's an obvious point. You complain about what you think the contract is. You go to McDonald's, you want fast food. So I'll complain if it's five minutes fast. I won't complain about anything else because I know what the deal is here. Go to a restaurant, I'll complain about all of that. So if people in church complain about, do you know what, you went three minutes over last Sunday. <laughs> you may not know that. What are they actually complaining about? What are they actually saying? This service has to fit exactly into my time schedule because I am such an important person that three minutes will rob me of the rest of my week. So please do it quick. If someone, I know this is a caricature, but if someone does sit in their pew, <laughs> what are they saying? This is my place. This is my place. And it actually, it has to be for me. And I've all, I, I, you know, genuinely, I've always sat there. And I'm not really interested in, in anybody else coming. And so on and so forth. In my church, people complained because they weren't being cared for, because they thought that was the deal. What does it mean for us to move to a form of pastoral care? Please don't misunderstand me, I'm not talking about boot camp. But a form of pastoral care that actually says, our ministry to you is in order that you might be enabled to live the life that God has for you not just to feel cared for. So we move from what I've called a PC world, a pastoral care world, to a pastoral equipping or a pastoral enabling world. Now for those of us who are in full-time ministry, what that means is, well, it's got a number of implications. Firstly, the people we will choose to spend time with we know, I know, and I'm conscious as I'm speaking here to some of you, that some of you have responsibility for multiple, uh, uh, multiple parishes. And your time is taken and often must be sort of, it must feel as though your time is primarily taken just by keeping the show going. But actually, who do you need to spend time with in order that you might understand where they are? rather than just being the fourth emergency service. 
What does it mean for your pastoral care teams? For them to be part of enabling the people of God to live missionally for him, to grow as disciples, rather than simply you're cared for. This is a huge cultural shift in many of our churches. And I think what it actually goes back to is the proper form of pastoral care. I think at that point we become a little closer to the ministry of spiritual direction. So that's my second point. My third point is that we live in a world where there's an awareness that as Christians, the uh, authority that we may once have had has gone or is going, and at best we are now people who have influence. So we have to enable people to think about how do they live in a world where Christian values and Christian expectations are not automatic, but that actually we live as people of influence. And what we've done, and I'm not going to... No not going to take much time to explore this, but we try to enable people to have a vision, a big vision of what does it mean to be a missional people in their scattered lives. You see, for some people, the problem is that if you say, well actually in your scattered world, wherever you are, school gate, wherever that may be, actually you can serve the purpose of God. For some people what they equate that with is being nice. And depending on your tradition, or there's another sort of equation, which is you've got to leave a Jesus into every conversation, no matter how artificial it may seem. You know, today's a lovely day out. Let me tell you, it's lovely out there. Um, really nice weather. It's a shame you're here. Um, <laughs> and uh, you go and you speak to your neighbour later, and you go, it's been a lovely day, hasn't it? Uh, they say to you, and you're expected to say, yes, it was exactly this weather when I first met Jesus. You, now... <laughs> You can do a mission like that if you wish. But here's the thing, here's a serious point. If by mission, we come from a tradition that says it's only about being nice, then where's the grit of the gospel? Jesus didn't get crucified because he kept saying to people, just be nice to one another. He was crucified because actually he declared himself to be a different king. And that's threatening. But at the same time, if a good day is, did you explicitly talk about Jesus today? Then for most people, we will go to sleep that night going, here's another failure of a day. We need to have a range of ways of what does it mean to serve the purpose of God in the places we find ourselves. And we've explored this in uh, books and, and small group resources we've done. But it involves things like making good work. It involves things like modelling godly character. And the little letters there are simply the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience and the rest. It involves ministering grace and love. It involves moulding a culture, changing the way things might be done round your way. It involves being a mouthpiece for truth and justice. And it does involve being a messenger for the gospel. But it's all of that. And it's probably more, but it's all of that. And actually, if you start to think through ministry through that lens, well, how are we enabling people to envisage this and envision this in their own lives? Because the problem with all of this stuff is it can sound remarkably just like church talk. But actually, what does it mean for us to be a people of God who are learning godly character. If I wanted to be a little bit provocative, let me ask you this question. Why are there so many rude people in church? <laughs> now clearly you've never come across any of them, but... <laughs> Why? Why do we belong to communities? where people sometimes, for decades, have just alienated everybody around them. It's like this, isn't it? Paddy, um, I'm going to use these two guys that are from, there's Paddy and Phil. Paddy is in the cheap seats, but Phil is next to him. 
And uh, we'll do it with Phil comes to it. Phil, in a, in a smallish church, when someone comes for the first time, it's brilliant, isn't it? Just in case you're not certain, the answer is yes. <laughs> I could see that for some of you that's a really confusing question. I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Where's this going? <laughs> when new people come in a small church, let me tell you, it is always great. Oh, you see your catch on well. second week, you think you're on the verge of revival. <laughs> Phil's new to church and he's come back for the second time. And I look at Phil and I go, it's remarkable, he looks normal. Um, and uh, Paddy's been in church with us for decades. I've only borrowed your name now, Paddy. <laughs> And Paddy is one of those characters that's a little bit spiky and a little bit difficult. <laughs> it's clear why he's the Archdeacon. He's, um... <laughs> You're never quite sure where you are with Paddy. One minute he's all over you and the next minute he's blanking you. <laughs> only borrowed your name. <laughs> and, uh... And Phil comes to church. And after a few, after a few weeks or months, Phil comes to me, I'm, I'm the leader of the church, I'm the minister of the church, uh, and Phil comes and goes, Neil, I don't know what I've done, but Paddy has just bitten my head off. How many of you know how the rest of that conversation goes? Phil, it's not you. He's like that with all of us. And what I do then is I sit down with Phil, and for 20 minutes I explain how you can avoid Paddy. <laughs> Because I'm well skilled at it. Because ultimately, ultimately, I'm a little frightened of Paddy. I'm frightened that if I actually say to him, Paddy, you are, it's wrong. It's wrong. We are the people of God. I'm frightened that if I say that to him, he'll kick off with me and leave the church. Or worse, Stay. <laughs> you know, if you were just going to leave, that would be a good outcome. <laughs> so here's the thing. If, if we believe that one of the ministries that each of us are called to um, demonstrate is to model godly character with your family and your friends and your work colleagues and to minister grace and love when you're in positions of authority in the local council or in the local voluntary group then we need to be practicing that in our local communities we need to have robust conversations with one another that say we are not looking for perfectionism but we are saying, we'll hold one another to the things we say we believe. The sadness often is that nobody spoke to Paddy decades ago. Final, what does it mean to go from in to out? And what I mean by this is, what does it look like to be a church that is not just thinking about itself, but is actually living for the sake of the village or the town, or indeed the region? The way we've talked when we've worked with churches, and we've worked with dioceses and churches of all sorts of descriptions from a brilliant, brilliant Anglo-Catholic church in Tottenham to New Wine churches to Middle of the Road churches 
in the Anglican Communion. And um, what we have seen is that actually once you start equipping people for the places where they already are, your vision as a church expands. Because actually you're taking seriously where they may be. And I don't know what it's like for you, but actually I know in, in, in our, I, I'm, I'm not an Anglican, and I think it's clear to you now why I'm not an Anglican. <laughs> you wouldn't have me. But, um, but I know the diocese really quite well uh, in Salford in Manchester. And uh, I know it there, lots of parishes people drive into. They're not all living in the local parish. They're, they're traveling in. And actually, if you're only, if you're on, I know you have to be, but if you're only parish focused, then those people who travel in often feel dislocated from the missional impulse of the church. But if actually you're equipping people who do travel, you're saying actually our church has a bigger ministry through our, a, a bigger impact through our ministry than we might believe. But how do you make the changes? Well, one of the things you can do is you can go to Phil Cansdale's seminar this afternoon. But the other thing you can do is you can make one degree shifts. Most of us are vision weary, and most of us actually recognise that if you're going to start something, then the two times you can start it are either September or January. And it's too late to start in September now, isn't it? Because it's like July. <laughs> So we can't do anything in September, no, someone's here. And uh, so we'll aim for January, but then, to be honest, we might miss January, and then there's no point because it's Easter, and then, well, holidays. So it'll be September again. So any, any plan we have, even in local church, no matter how large our local church is, we normally say, well, it's got to be some distant future. But let me tell you, there are some things you can do on Sunday. And you don't need anybody's permission. Because on Sunday, some of you will stay behind and have coffee with people. Do you serve coffee? Yes. Tea? Is it decent? Yes. <laughs> no, but they're not fussy. Um, <laughs> okay, so here we go. At the end of service, you serve tea and coffee. Why do you serve it? Are they dehydrated? <laughs> Why do you serve them tea and coffee? So they'll stay. You want them to stay and you want them to talk and you want them to socialize. What do you want them to talk about? Yeah, on the front row they're doing very well by the way folks. All right, just telling you. you want them to talk about what's just happened in the last hour? What does that mean for where I'm going to be? I don't know, and I'm not projecting this onto you, but I know that for some people, the gap between the church and the world is not can we get a vocabulary for ourselves about our faith into the world, it's actually can we get it into the coffee lounge? So on Sunday, you will stay for coffee. And I know that this works, because I've seen it in churches of all sorts of denominations. If you begin a different conversation with people, where are you going to be this week? And what's the biggest challenge you're going to face? And how can I pray for you? And then some of you might be even so brave as to say, can I pray for you now? But, I, but, but we're Anglican, so we probably wouldn't do that. <laughs> but if, if on Wednesday you contact them and say, I'm just ringing to say, I'm still praying for you. People might know they are belonging to a different sort of community. Some of you will lead prayers on Sunday. What will you pray about? Well, you'll pray about the big stuff, and rightly so. And you'll pray about those people who might be ill, rightly so. But what are the living, ongoing challenges of the people you're worshipping with that you could include in your intercessory prayers? Some of you will preach on Sunday. How are you seeing the word you're preaching lived out in the missional impulse of God? 
And can you imagine what this looks like for people in your congregation who have grandchildren and they're longing and they see that, prim that, that may well be one of the primary ministry areas that they see in their life. What does it mean to be a missional grandparent? How do you pray for your grandchildren when your own children said, to be honest, it's not really for us. And you don't have authority anymore and you're ministering from a position of vulnerability. What does it mean to be a missional grandparent? And how might your preaching help? There are things you can do this Sunday. You don't need to go to a PCC and have 15 months of consultation. <laughs> what you do is you begin to model a different culture. The culture that says God's maybe wrestling with us that we might be his people for the sake of the world. Well, I'm just about done now. But we've left a little bit of time for you to um, perhaps just to explore or to reflect. You may have some questions or you may have some reflections of your own. And uh, we've got about 10 minutes, so if there are some things that you'd like to ask. In order to help us with this, and in order to help you, if you've got a burning question but you're not sure if it's a good question or not, do you want to just turn to someone who looks vaguely intelligent next to you? <laughs> trapped um, <laughs> and, and it's not so easy well just go with what you've got and um, this is what I want you to do just for a minute each just is there one thing <laughs> it's like a plea is there one thing <laughs> is there one thing you've heard that actually you go that's important for me to carry can you just share it with the person that's with you and to be honest if you're the introvert type and the, the shy type this is how you deal with situations like this you just say, say, oh, that's time up. Uh, so just with the person you're there, what's, what's the one thing that, that does grab you? What's the one thing that struck you as you were listening? if it would be helpful, but you may have uh, just a, a reflection or a comment or a question, and uh, we've got a few minutes just for that to happen. So, yeah, right at the top there. We like what you said about people being rude. <laughs> <laughs> and many people can be astonishingly rude in church, especially if you're doing something like church, it's not like it. But how do we deal with that rudeness, which may be very deep, 
preaching about the room just then they'll tell you we're preaching a really good sermon because obviously you're preaching to everybody else around. <laughs> <laughs> um, and is it possible that what happens in a church is that those things that are making us experience life really, really subjectively, because there are lots and lots of pressures associated with us to do that, are allowed full run in a church context, whereas in other places like workplaces and so forth, people have to discipline themselves and not be subjective. Okay. I've been asked to repeat the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me just kind of paraphrase question. What do we do about um, folks for whom uh, for, what do we deal with, how do we deal with rude people? And how do we deal with it when, um, when if we preach about it they don't hear and how do we help people who may actually use the gathered church opportunities as a, a, a release valve yeah. for the pressures that they face? Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> This is, this is what I think. This is what I do. <laughs> Firstly, I think that there's, there's something around this idea of what does it mean to be the church of Jesus Christ? Um, and what responsibility do we have, not only to God but to one another? It's the horizontal and vertical expression. Now, I know that we're trying to do that all the time, but the truth is that sometimes what we've got to do is do this work of enabling people to grow and it actually a lot of this stuff can only be done face to face. That's the bad news. Because preaching one to many, in my experience is, you get a really good sermon on it and then the person you really want to hear it isn't there. <laughs> They've been to every other week, but not that week. But in all seriousness, there's something that says, actually, and it is a conversation that sits down with someone and says, you may not be aware of the impact you're having. I can see so much that could be better, because I know you. I actually always begin from that assumption with people. You probably don't, you're probably not aware. Because I don't actually think most people are maligned. I don't, I mean I know some folks might be, but most people are not. They're not actually trying to destroy Christian community. They're not actually trying to paint themselves into a corner. They're not actually trying to alienate everybody from them. But they just do. And it needs someone to tell the truth. And that is a difficult thing to do. There's a little lady in my own place who a few years ago, um, she was a, a professional woman, she had responsibilities at work, but we always knew that she'd struggled at work. And we, we'd only ever got one side of the story. And one Sunday morning, I, I, my practice before, before worship is I'm out on the pathway outside church looking for unsuspecting worshippers to drag in. <laughs> and um, and I, as I'm walking up and down, I spot her and I sort of, hello, do my hail fellow well met bit. And she goes, hmm. and flounces, which is a good word that we don't use enough, and flounces. And I think to myself, I can't have upset her. Not already. I've only said hello. And then I begin to think, and this is, this is exactly what happened. I began to think, I think, there's no point me or us as a church talking about all of this sort of stuff and trying to do it if actually you never know where you are. So I said to Mary, who uh, is one of the co-leaders with me, I said, Mary, you know, we've got this issue, we've got to deal with her, uh, you should see her. <laughs> and um, it wouldn't have been appropriate for me, she was a single woman. And, um, <laughs> And of course, Mary went through a list of other ways we might deal with the situation. <laughs> Mostly ignore it. Um, but actually, in the end, Mary did and sat down. And, and it was a difficult conversation, but it wasn't a confrontational conversation, but it was a difficult one. Now, of course, I don't know how you are, but when people call me out on my behaviour, I normally want to defend myself. So if you tell me, Neil, that was unkind what you said, I will normally try and find a reason. 
you know, as to why I acted like that. That's natural. So you've got to expect that. And some people get really cross when you call them out. And how dare you? And that's a defense mechanism too. But actually the reason I dare is because, and I know it can sound a bit soppy, the reason I dare is because I love you. And I'm deeply committed to you. Now you may take your bat and ball home at this point. And you may call me all sorts of things. But actually, I'm deeply committed to your spiritual health. And I'm deeply believing that you can make a difference for the kingdom of God. That's why we're having this conversation. That's not an easy conversation to have. But it needs someone to be brave enough to say, enough. It stops. I'm not talking about us all being in some sort of behavioural sort of one, you know, <laughs> you know, one party state. Most, most things actually, a lot of grace and a bit of tolerance will deal with. And actually a lot of the stuff that people get upset about between each other, including myself, is just my own little pettiness. And to be honest, a good night's sleep and we're dealt with. It's not that. It's that deep sense that someone is painting themselves out of the grace of God. That's what worries me. And as a community of faith together, if we can't have that conversation, what are we about? Now, it, it, I kind of want to qualify this in so many different ways because every situation is different and you need the wisdom and you need the discernment that comes from the spirit. You need to be able to know how best to deal with people. You need to know your own personality and how you react in this situation because some of you, we all, we all act differently and we react differently and what we are like in public is very different to the way we are in private afterwards and so we've got all of that to deal with and we've got our own fears and all the rest of it. But actually, ultimately, it needs the courage of someone to say, I am your brother or your sister in Christ. I'm deeply committed to you. I'm really concerned about what's going on here. If you knew someone in your congregation was acting in a way in their family life that effectively was abusive verbally, would you go, oh well, it's just the way they are? Or as a community would you go, we've got a responsibility to help one another to live a different way? Well, I said there was time for questions. I kind of meant a question. <laughs> Thanks ever so much for listening. We're going to break. Thank you. Neil, thank you so much. I think what I carry away from that is the need for all of our churches and the bits of the church that I found myself particularly engaged with to learn how to have the hard conversations well. I remember somebody once saying that we must learn how to have a disagreement or a conversation about difficult things and not, not hit below the belt, but on the other side also not to wear our belts below the chin. Um, <laughs> And to have that ability to both to give loving criticism and also to receive it when it's, when it's lovingly meant and to strengthen our discipleship together. You know, you've really focused some massively important stuff which we can carry straight home into our own churches and we are so grateful to you for this. Thank you. Coffee awaits.